Welcome to week three of HI3284. This week is all about primary sources and finding primary sources to work with has never been easier, trust me. It has never been easier. It can still be deceptive in terms of using digital primary sources, but it's amazing what you are able to find now. However, you need to have your wits about you. You need all your historical training in order to read primary sources effectively and well, and to get that sense again, that twitching in your fingers, that sense of whether there are other ones out there that you need to find in order to understand your topic adequately. So this first part of the lecture, I'm talking about primary sources and primary sources, what we can do with them, how we need to be trained in order to use them. And the second part, I'm talking about some tools that you can use to manage them. And we'll build on that in the workshop this week as well. Just to reiterate that point, finding primary sources to work with has never been easier. Never. But that doesn't mean that working with primary sources is easy. It's great to find them, but interpreting them is difficult and also knowing quite what we're talking about when we talk about primary sources is a little bit slippery. So the standard definition of a primary source tends to be something that was recorded at the time in question by someone who was there. But that's a little problematic, even with what we think of as traditional primary sources. If you're looking at a painting, well, that takes time to produce. And with records, visual records of things like voyages of discovery, images are often worked up sometime later using notes. So those notes are recorded by people there at the time. The paintings may be produced by someone who was actually there or someone in that person's workshop, and it is still generally counted as a primary source. Similarly, memoirs, people writing about their lives later on, are not secondary sources. They haven't got that consideration that historians tend to bring to their work. But they're also often worked up later, sometimes with notes, like those images from voyages. They're useful to historians. I treat memoirs as primary sources, but I think that suspicion, deeply ingrained in all historians, comes into play here as well. We always treat our sources with suspicion, and primary sources are no exception. We're aware of their limitations, we're aware of their failings, and so we can actually do quite useful things with them. And that matter of being recorded by someone who is actually there is problematic too. We tend to count second-hand material, such as newspaper reports, as primary sources. Generally, the reporter wasn't actually there, but has talked to people who were. And when it comes to changing historical interpretations, suddenly secondary sources slide to being our primary sources. So if I want to talk about how the history of a particular past event has changed, my primary sources are the historical accounts of that event. It becomes quite slippery. The idea that there are primary and secondary sources is useful, but it can't be fully universalized. You know in your own context whether you're using something as a primary source or as a secondary source, and you can recognize when things might be either one or the other, despite being the same thing. There is no single foolproof definition of what constitutes a primary source, and historians tend to build with what comes to hand. Sometimes they're doing their best to realise particular vision, so they've got a question they want to answer, they go and find the sources that will help them do that. Sometimes they're fitting what they build to what they've found, so they've got a particular set of sources and they're delving in to find out what they can do with those things. Essentially, you have to continually ask yourself what you're building and whether the sources you are using are the best sources that you could reasonably hope to find to do that with. And sometimes as well, you have to listen to the silences. Sometimes you have to consider what a lack of sources might be telling you about these past events. 
But to continue with one of those extended metaphors which run out of control in the subject. When you are doing this, what you are building will always be a lean-to, and it will always carry some risk of demolition, because it is extremely unlikely that you can avoid interpretation, or that it's going to be completely clear what your sources are telling you, and you cannot hope to find completely comprehensive primary sources. On that note, smoking gun primary sources are rare. Sometimes you stumble on something unexpectedly convincing, but that is extremely unusual. On this page, I'm showing what were, to me, smoking gun primary sources, although the subject in 2020 didn't see it the same way. And I can understand why. And looking at these things, certainly the thing on the left hand there, it's to YouTube historical presentation. How can a historian talking about past events be considered a primary source? For me, it was. And that's because of the way I came to it. While there are very few smoking gun sources, even if they exist, you need a lot of training in order to be able to recognize them for what they are. Or perhaps not a lot of training, but a good sense of context. So let me tell you about the context of these documents. The context, 2020, that was when COVID was starting to unroll. And I was looking at precedents for COVID and knowledge of precedents of COVID, which is why this becomes a primary source. In New Zealand, Geoffrey Rice is a historian of the 1918-1920 flu pandemic. He has done a tremendous amount of work, very good work on that, and has done it for a long time. So in New Zealand, there is a national history of that flu pandemic based on death records. That's what he produced. For me, this is a smoking gun saying, people who needed to know about this stuff knew about this stuff because here is a presentation, 100 years after the start of that pandemic, given by this major historian of the pandemic. And if you look down the bottom, it's given at the Ministry of Health in New Zealand. Similarly, the New Zealand Influenza Pandemic Plan, which you can see on the right, on the inside page, Geoffrey Rice and his work has a clear acknowledgement. The Ministry of Health is across the work of Geoffrey Rice. This precedent is known and known to people in government, in the right parts of government, in New Zealand. For me, this is a smoking gun. My students, it's a YouTube video about the 1918 flu pandemic. It's a good YouTube video about the 1918 flu pandemic and I can highly recommend it, but seeing it as a smoking gun requires that sense of precedence and it's also contingent on the questions that I'm asking. And even here, in order to make that argument, I'm not relying on a single overwhelming piece of evidence. On the screen, there are already two. Two pieces of evidence that the Ministry of Health is aware of the work of Geoffrey Rice. And history tends to do that. It needs the accumulation of evidence rather than a single amazing source that tells the entire story. And historians have careers because they disagree over the interpretation that should be made of different sources. And we build careers on that. As I say, your lean-to is likely to be demolished at any point. I had an experience of this also in 2020. I had given a radio interview and I was contacted by the president of the Cooktown Reenactment Society because she and I interpreted events over turtles in Cooktown differently. On the slide, there are extracts from the journals of Cook and Banks about an event that follows a conflict over turtles while the endeavour is laid up at the Endeavour River. I do not think that this particular event marked reconciliation. Cook uses the word, but it seems to me that he uses it in a very small sense. Banks doesn't use that particular term. And I think reading these extracts, my interpretation is that the local people of the region were extremely generous towards the voyagers, 
but that reconciliation is not appropriate considering that the Europeans in this interaction didn't express regret or a desire to do things differently in the future. The president of the Cooktown Reenactment Society, though, comes from a different context. I think there are two contexts for her. One is local stories about the area and the sense that this place, this place mentioned in these journals, is actually an important one for local people. So she recognises what the Indigenous people in these accounts are doing. She recognises that as an act of reconciliation, this sign of fraternity. And she's aware of the significance of that particular place, a place that there should be no blood drawing conflict within. And so she interprets it differently, partly I think because she has a different context and partly because she has an interest in Cooktown heritage. And Cooktown heritage is an interesting performance in itself. And it's a performance, I think, not necessarily of the past, but of the future. And this is something that we'll come to in this subject when we discuss heritage. So I think the idea of reconciliation and reconciliation within Australian history is one that's quite precious. And in this case, is being kindled by the sense of heritage around Cooktown. And I hope this provides you with an example of how context can affect interpretation of primary sources and how different interpretations can arise and can be equally legitimate. Using primary sources well is not easy. You do have guides. While historians like to disagree, we still read each other, we still listen to each other, we still consider how previous historians have considered evidence, and we are allowed to agree with them, if appropriate. We also search widely to try and find those slow accumulations of evidence. We see if we have to rely on a single piece of evidence, or if we can back it up with other pieces that support it. We need to be aware of our biases and our viewpoints. And in my account of reconciliation or otherwise at the Endeavour River, it might be that I'm coming from a biased viewpoint of Australian history, which is leading me to think that Europeans in this context aren't capable of reconciliation. We need to move beyond being just aware of our biases and exercise our imagination and our sympathy. And this can be quite difficult if people acting in the past are very different. And we need to remember, people in the past are not just us in funny clothes. They had their own worldviews. They may be speaking different languages. They've got their own context. And it is a real act of imagination and a difficult thing to try and enter those worlds and to understand what they're doing in their own terms. But that's what historians do. And I've also mentioned that when you gather evidence, it's not enough to just be impressed by how much evidence you've gathered. You also need to consider the absences and the silences and whether they're caused by the archives and the archives not catching evidence that might have existed, or whether that absence of evidence is in fact evidence of absence. That the absence of that evidence might be telling you something about the past. And as you come to write your history, you have to be unashamed of this process. We can't find out all sorts of things about the past, but we can still write good history. And it's okay when the history we write is about interpretation, so long as we're honest about what we can't know. Interpretation is what we do. It's what makes us historians rather than chroniclers. And so these amazing primary sources, which are available to us, don't settle the questions. They just raise a whole lot more for us to get our teeth into.